Hello, and welcome to Planning Toronto, which is a slightly different thing than I thought it was going to be, but that's mainly because I've spent the day revising part four. It's always fun when you do these things. Anyway. So this is another map of the operation, and it's worthwhile considering from that perspective, because you have Force H coming in and going out, it's launching its attacks on the base in Sardinia. But also, you have all these various convoys going backwards and forwards. And if you look at it, the main Mediterranean fleet stays within the convoy route for a long time. Time. And this is all part of the operation. Because Taranto is not just an air attack. Taranto is about, refu about bringing more ships to the Mediterranean fleet. It's about getting Baron there. It's about getting various destroyers and cruisers out to the Mediterranean fleet to reinforce them. In many ways, it's an operation where if one thing goes right, you've had a good time because you've got these convoys to these important places. If you then get the reinforcements, that's great. You pull off the airstrike, that's brilliant. But pulling off that airstrike is going to be a big thing because whilst Taranto is not the, as strong a position as Wilhelm, Wil, Wilhelmshaven, it's deeper. Not massively deep, but deeper than the Wilhelmshaven. It's still right on the inside of the boot heel of Italy. You can see, clearly illustrated in this map, exactly where Taranto is. So you have to make sure not only are the Italians not looking at the Ionian Sea, that they are confident in their superiority of the Ionian Sea. And this has meant that Taranto is an operation which takes place in November. But there have been works and ideas going on into this since September in the patterns and the way they've been operating the fleets and the way things have been maneuvering. Reconnaissance has been being done, but nothing so obvious that it will be seen. And yes, there are regular overflights by the RAF going on over Taranto to monitor the aircraft, monitor the ships in there. But they're doing lots of other ports as well, and honestly, that's expected. That is part of it. That is what you do. Now, to get the information is... Uh, is a bit of fun because, well, the RAF photo reconnaissance unit on Malta are very security conscious. That's one way we can put it. And they don't want to share anything directly in terms of the images they take with the Navy officially. That's their official rulings by their senior officers. However, they agree to leave the Royal Navy officer alone with the documents and take, you know, take his notes and etc. Intelligence officer who's, well, intelligence officer, pilot, who's flown over there, who will go back full of, well, with a cockpit full of potatoes, actually, for HMS Illustrious, which is even more warmly treated. And, well, let's put it this way. Takes photos, borrows some documents, and goes away happily. And no, and that's it. He's left alone, though. The thing is, if you want to actually enforce that level of security, you need to stay in the room and watch him. But a bottle of whiskey, I think, is the provisions. Uh, and the officers in the squadron who should be overseeing him are far more pragmatic about it than perhaps the person who's in charge of the fiefdom who's laying down the rules. Because, yes, there are some good security reasons for not sharing all that information out widely. But 
there is a different pra a different scenario when you are planning an operation and you can wander to the hut a few doors down, check the information and go back on planning, to when you are doing the planning on an aircraft carrier at sea a long way away from where the information is being gathered. And honestly, one of the lessons which comes out of Toronto is that the Royal Navy would like its own onboard carrier reconnaissance capability. And if you look at some of the th decisions they make during the years as they go on, there is a constant effort focused on maintaining some reconnaissance capability of their own. So they don't have to rely on outsiders to get around us. There's also smart now Skynet, but we'll leave that to one, uh, one side. So here is Toronto, and this is its harbour. Mar Grande and Mar Piccolo. There is an island sitting there, as I described earlier in part one, but it's not like Heligoland. It's far closer in, but it is part of the air defence of the island and of the, ba um, of the bay. Taranto is a critical point. If you have a fleet operating from there, as you can see, it can get straight to the Greek coast. It can get straight into the eastern Mediterranean. The other bases that the Italian Navy can use, Naples. Well, that's the other side of Sicily. And it's very nice for the central Mediterranean but and western Mediterranean, but to get to eastern Mediterranean, you have to do a lot of fuel to go down and around Sic uh, down and through the Sicilian Straits or around Sicily, depending on how strong you are in your belief that there's no British submarine sitting there from Malta. It's rather the same with going up the Adriatic. The further you go up the Adriatic, that's great. You're safe. But the point about the Italian Navy is the Adriatic is supposed to be their sea. The Mediterranean is Mare Nostrum. See, but um, the Adriatic is. Well, it's, it's not just our sea, it's our paddling pool. It's, it's, it's kind of like the difference between your front garden and your back garden on your house, if you have those things. Your front garden is lovely, and it is your space. But if you're anything like me, you have a small fence, because that's what the building regulations allow, and people can get in if they really want to. You will push them out, but they can get in if they want to. But the back garden has a fence all around, around a big one. It has a wall, a wall and parts of it. it, it, it it's they're not getting in there unless you give them permission or unless they're prepared to really break the law and jump uh, and go a uh, scale a full size fence. The Adriatic is that bad garden. And the garden gate that stops people going in and out as they wish, that is the fleet base at Taranto. You can therefore not overstate how important this position is. But, and if you're looking at that smaller picture, which I'm just about to expand, you can also, on looking here, realize that it does provide quite a lot of access for attacking aircraft. This is something the British had noticed in the 1920s, had planned in the 1930s, and in 1940 were actually going to deliver it. And boy, were they prepared to deliver it. Now, planning actually goes through several stages. Uh, there's a point during the plan where they're planning on or having all aircraft on your carriers that's eagle and lustrous available which is the plan i used when discussing the alternative for what might have happened if eagle had been available i.e the plan on paper then there was the plan based on 
the reality of even having Ego Lustrous available, which was based on two strikes of 15 Swordfish going off from each carrier, with possibly more Swordfish being added in. There was a talk of it being increased to as many as 18 Swordfish from each carrier. And a debate as to whether or not the any of the full Mars would get involved. And it goes slowly, the full Mars go up and down as to their involvement, the number of swordfish being involved go up and down. But if you have, let's say, 30 swordfish involved, then the aim was for nine of them to be carrying torpedoes in each group of 15. So there'd be 18 swordfish, 18 torpedo aircraft. If you had 36, and as I said, with the nine, uh, with the nine full Mars, thirty-six swordfish from the nine full Mars, and they were long, uh, they were put into the three strikes of fifteen aircraft. Then you would have had prob eight, probably twenty-four, possibly as many as twenty-seven torpedo aircraft. Now, the decision has been made to go torpedo heavy. Why? Now, we have discussed that the ways of sinking a ship, that if you make a hole in it and that lets a lot of water in, it tends to sink. But also, you have to think about what are the primary targets. The RN would love to kill some Italian cruisers. They've got, that's why some swordfish are carrying bombs. But primarily, those bombs, those flares, those systems they're carrying are there to distract the Italians and their AA fire from focusing in on the torpedo aircraft. It's all about the torpedo aircraft. Why? Because bombs might damage a battleship. But enough torpedoes and you're dealing with the very same maths which Jellicoe was dealing with at Jutland. Yes, the damage you inflict can depend on where you actually hit your target. But the odds of you hitting and inflicting the required amount of damage to knock a ship out multiply impressively the more hits you achieve when you hit with a torpedo you're going to do a lot of damage now there is a debate as to whether or not the british knew there were five or six battleships in Tranto. Cunningham, in his book, and in a quote I will read in the next part, wrote five. There were six there. I think there's a reason for this. Andrea Doria is not fully commissioned. But also, in most of the analysis, pre the strike, the British seem to have worked out very quickly on that Gilio Cesare was going to be a very difficult ship to hit. Three out of five sounds far more impressive than three out of six, especially when you realize the sixth one you couldn't hit. Now, here's a little quote from Cunningham. In a total flying time of just six and a half hours, carried a carrier 20 aircraft and inflicted more damage upon the Italian fleet than was inflicted upon the German high seas fleet in the daylight action of Battle of Jutland. Think of where they've come from. They've come from things which were really considered psychological warfare to try and drive and goad an enemy into coming out into something far more into an actual strike weapon. These are some of the words I wrote in my PhD thesis. 
In truth, it had to be a night of a full moon, so that the navigators could read their chart. And so it was, with the waves shimmering black turquoise in reflection of its radiance, the 20, very nearly 21, purring shadows passed over. Of course, one aircraft had to stand back. Shadows which were collections of canvas, string, and other metal. Each housing within them two crew shivering through anticipation, fear, cold, a mixture of all three, most likely, and each carrying a heavy load. And flying such for nearly two hours, they reached their target, safe haven of the enemy fleet. They had plunged through the darkness, a feat of skill which would never be forgotten, because let's be honest, this is pre GPS, this is pre all those navigation aids you and I take for granted, this is pre all navigation aids modern pilots take for granted. Another reason why British aircraft tend to be two seat aircraft night flying, you need the navigator. And soon thereafter, the moon was not the only light in the night, as it was joined by shells bursting into a thousand shooting stars, and was always, as was always the case for some on both sides, they did not follow night. Some of fact notwithstanding, this was still a special night. It was night the fleet air arm proved, once and for all, it could do its job, even with equipment more akin to that which had been used in the previous war. It was therefore this attack, the Battle of Taranto, which had been launched from HMS Illustrious, the leadership of Admiral Henderson's armoured hangar carriers. That was the proof of the pudding, demonstration of the capability and reach of the Royal Navy's fleet air arm. The point is, the plan and the planning and the preparation that goes into all this, all the operation, is what makes it able to be pulled off. The Royal Navy really does understand the capabilities of the systems it has built, and it knows why it's built them. To modernize, the swordfish looks antiquated and ancient even before World War II begins, but to the eyes at the time, it was built for stability, it was built for rugged, uh, ruggedity, it was built to survive, but most importantly, it was built to be flyable. This is not anything against the skill the pilots involved, because trust me, even an easy-to-fly plane is very difficult at night. But if you're thinking about a night attack, if you're planning, if you're preparing, if you're thinking about a war as the British were, then this was how you had to do it. And this is the fact you're dealing with. Sop with Cuckoo was a short range, probably within visual range almost, of HMS Furious strike aircraft with torpedo. Single seat, fly the torpedo up and drop it off. This is a long range strike aircraft. This is 20 years of development. This is a torpedo which will not duck down. Flop. This is a torpedo which will hit its target. In shallow waters or in heavy sea. One of the quotes from the, one of the pilots, and uh, one I'll be reading out a lot, uh, probably in the report Long Patrol, and uh, next uh, part of Long Patrol, and in the live tomorrow night, that's the 11th of November 2021, talks about the maneuvers he's doing to get his aircraft through the flak and into the fighting line, and then He's done all these maneuvers, and then he has to slow the aircraft down. He has to get it level to drop the torpedo. And after carrying it all that way, he was going to make sure it hit his target.
when I put these two pictures up together, I am often reminded by people, oh, it shows how much the British hadn't developed in 20-odd years. But actually, the difference between these aircraft is imaginable. Unimaginable. Colossal. They might both look biplane. But in horsepower, this is far more. In range, this is far more. In operational versatility, this is a thing of beauty. And it's because of those factors, because of development, which starts with the Swordfish Brigade, that a Swordfish will stay in service throughout World War II. And this is what you have to think about. This is what we have to consider. Now, this is the harbour, and this tells you everything you need to know about the strike, because there's the island which has all sorts of AA on it. There are the fuel tanks and other defences. There is the Marpicolo, which has the destroyers and the smaller ships in, they are in protection. And this is the Mar Grande, which has the bigger ship. The RN have been planning this operation for a long time. They know this hard. During times of peace, British warships have visited the harbour. Midshipmen, who do sketching and have to provide books as part of their you know, diaries, as part of their training, will regularly be seen sketching harbours they go into, and oh, midshipmen who produce very good sketches might well be sent down the oceanographic route to go and do sort of mapping the world's oceans, the world's shorelines. This means that the Royal Navy has an abundance, an abundance of material to draw from. Some of the officers in planning could actually go back to their old midshipmen's books, which many of them still had with them, and take out their own sketches of the harbour. And yes, some things will have changed. Maybe air defence has been added, searchlights, those things. That's what you have up-to-date photo reconnaissance for. But the general formation of the harbour, probably not going to change much. Some of the depths they've done, not going to change much, because... It might well have done depth readings, especially those who actually did have an oceanographic bent rather than just an inclination. This is the other point about the Royal Navy in World War II. They benefit hugely from a vast array of institutional memory. which they have painstakingly preserved and which goes into much of this operation. When a storm takes out some of the torpedo nets and some of the balloon barriers and the Italians don't replace it because they either lack the hydrogen or lack the inclination, there's a debate as to which it was, the British were quite happy because they predicted that if there had, was any storm, it would take out that portion. Why? Because, presumably, some midshipmen had charted the underwater. And when you have as accurate 
and meteorologists and weather professionals as the Royal Navy has, and you understand the nature of the bay and the directions of the winds, you can predict these things. Now, having all this information would have been for absolutely naught if they hadn't had the ships they needed. Absolutely for naught. And as said, I'm going to devote part four in large part to accounts, to personal accounts. So I'm going to try and keep my own accounts to a minimum now. But I wanted to use this slide, which I had produced for the uh, for the Operation M8 video, as it has some rather interesting facts, which should be remembered. Now, the original schedule was for the twenty first of October. Yes. It was a moonlit night, and yes, the Royal Navy are that um, <clears throat> historically focused. Institutional memory coming to play here. Also, just imagine the dinners they're now organizing, because if you think about it, we have Taranto night dinners, and we have Trafalgar night dinners. And that's what the Royal Navy has, and those are wonderful things, and if anyone ever invites me to come and speak to them, I do a great line in after dinner speaking for them. Hey! I've got a plug and getting invites to those dinners are brilliant. It means I don't have to pay for them myself, myself to be there. But more importantly than all that, imagine the dinner that would be, be organized now if it was the Trafalgar and Taranto night dinner combined. You probably ended up with a statue of Cunningham. Up opposite Nelson in Trafalgar Square somewhere. Um, it would have been colossal. But life doesn't work out that way. The auxiliary tanks which replace the third crewman, but are take actually the second crewman, the observer seat in the centre of the in the forward part of the aft cockpit, which is the two-seater cockpit is a 60 Imperial gallon, that's a 273 litre auxiliary tank. And that has to be used because the center line fuel tank that they can also carry as a long range extended for extended operations goes where the torpedo goes. So if you're a torpedo aircraft, you're carrying that. They assign 24 air, uh, swordfish aircraft are uh, assigned to illustrious, but actually three of them have, end up having tainted oil from the tonin. Uh, tainted petrol, so they only actually get to launch 21. Twelve aircraft take part in the first wave, and nine, but only eight get for, uh, eight manage to make it because one has to go return home with uh, its own engine troubles because what its tankers decided to fall off. So that leaves eight are launched. 20 aircraft in total. Of those, ten are carrying torpedoes. So exactly 50%. But they would have liked more. They'd have liked 11 of 21. And honestly, if they'd had their first choice, you would probably be talking about at least 12 of 24 and a lot more the maryland aircraft from number 431 flight uh and malta are what are providing the reconnaissance but there's also a short sunlum used on the night 11th of november again it's better able for night flying All these are preparations going in. And all these things are factors which have to be thought through to prepare for it. 
you don't just put together a strike. You don't just decide how you're going to fit the aircraft up on a wing. It's been worked at and looked into for years when Taranto is finally launched. The torpedo is not chosen just because it's the best available weapon. It's been developed to be the best available weapon. That's the reality. For a long time, the British have looked at the bomb and gone, lovely. But it's just not big enough yet. Bomb sizes will grow dramatically during World War II. Some of the bigger bombs which we like to talk about, the Japanese and the Germans using, aren't available in 1940. In fact, a lot of them aren't. They're still being developed. And, and same with the British. What has been being consistently developed for decades by this point, ever since the Sopworth Cuckoo, is the aerial torpedo. So when they finally launched the strike, at Toronto, it's obvious the majority of aircraft and the emphasis is going to be placed on torpedo aircraft because this is the weapon that's been developed. This is the weapon that is fired. And the swordfish has been developed around deploying this weapon. The swordfish is stable because this needs to be stable when it's launched. The swordfish doesn't tend to, it can fly very slowly without stalling. This is because you don't want to release this when you're going too fast. It will break up. You want it to belly flop level. Swordfish is easy to fly to make the pilot's job easier to keep the aircraft straight and level and pointed at the target. Toronto is not an operation which comes to play, it comes into existence in a few weeks or a few days. Toronto is an operation which the British have been in preparation for for 20 years. And every single component that you see, that you hear about, that we talk about when we're talking about Toronto has been under development for that time. Even HMS Illustrious. She can have her entire air group reconfigured quickly. She can support, operate, and maintain and launch those aircraft and recover them. That has to be designed in. That's not just something which is, as much as we might believe it, uh, want it to be true, is just to do the can do attitude of the Royal Navy sailors. That is designed bone deep, hull deep, structurally deep into the ship. And that's the planning for Toronto. Take care, and I hope you're going to enjoy the two of these that are going to come out tomorrow, as well as a whole load of 60 second videos, if I manage to get them recorded in time. And don't forget the live on the 11th of November in the evening on the, at 2021. Thank you for watching.